Good morning, everyone. We welcome you all to Fardale Trinity Church. So happy you've joined us this beautiful Sunday morning to worship the Lord and fellowship together. As you make your way to your pews, we ask that you would rise with us as I read this morning's call to worship reading from Psalm 8, verse 1. It says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Let's pray. Lord, what a great reminder that you are Lord over all things. You are creator, sustainer, almighty God. And this morning, Father, we come to worship you, to sing praises to your name, and to learn more about you. And as we do, Father, we just pray that you would be honored and pleased with our hearts, with our minds, with our attitude, um, with everything, Lord. We just give ourselves completely to you this morning. And uh, we pray that you would do a work in each heart and each life. We love you. We commit this service to you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's worship the Lord with our voices. What is our hope?
broken place you came to sleep beneath the stars that you have made. What love my God would send the way of life to walk the road rejected and despised that you might you for your love which pours out on us through the cross, through the sacrifice of your son. We thank you for your love which is not deserved, just given because you love us, Lord. Because you want us. You say we are yours and we thank you for that, Lord that we can be like you. We can be like Christ. We're so blessed. We're so honored. Just please, Lord, open up our hearts, open up our minds, help us be hungry for the word today so that we can be more like you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're about to have our greeting time. During that time, we encourage you to drop your offering in the back of the sanctuary. Why don't we all greet one another in fellowship?
Why don't we all return to our pews? Let's all rise. Good morning, everybody, and again, welcome to Fardell Trinity Church on this beautiful Sunday morning, the last Sunday of August already. We've made it through the summer. We survived, although I think it's actually like the winters we survive and we thrive in the summer. It depends where you're from, uh, but we're glad you're here nonetheless, worshiping with us uh, this morning at Fardale. A couple of quick announcements. Of course, a reminder that if you missed anything, you want more information, our website's always available. We also encourage you to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, you can get uh, announcements through there, words of encouragement through there, and that's a great opportunity also uh, to share some of that uh, with your social network, right, your online social network. Also, if you need anything, if you have any questions that aren't answered through those uh, vehicles, you don't hear about it this morning, uh, Pastor Lee and Pastor Mike both have their emails in the bulletin. There's also the church office phone number there. And if you're here throughout the week, you want to stop by, Pastor Lee and Pastor Mike are both here throughout the week. Feel free to stop by. We'll help you out and, and give you as much information as we can or help you out with whatever you need uh, whenever we can. So we encourage you to plug in, not just here on Sunday morning, uh, but through our many ministries throughout the, the week and throughout the year. And as the school year starts, uh, we get into our fall schedule. So that's next week. Next weekend is the first weekend of September. Back to school. Parents, hold your applause, right? Back to school for our kids. A lot of our kids are back to college already or starting up this week. Uh, so we're going to start our, our school year schedule as well at Fardale. So instead of the service being 9.45 a.m., it'll be back at 10.45 a.m. And then that 9.30 hour, you can come to Sunday school. So Sunday school meets in Fellowship Hall at 9.30 uh, for the adults and throughout the church for kids ages 4 and up. So we encourage you to come out to Sunday school. We have a great teaching team once again ready to go uh, every Sunday morning at 9.30 to teach us from the Word. We're, we're journeying through uh, the Gospels uh, this fall. So we'll be in... Uh, we're leading up to like uh, Christ's uh, trial and crucifixion and his arrest and of course his resurrection. So we're kind of doing the Easter season stuff uh, in the fall. That's just the way the curriculum runs. We kind of run through the Bible uh, every three years. We make it all the way through and then we start over again. So we're in the beginning of the New Testament. We're in the gospel. So if you're excited about that, if you want to learn more about that, you want to unpack that more, we encourage you to come out to Sunday school. And of course, evening service at five o'clock at the chapel. So a different service than the morning. So a different message. If you missed the morning service or you want to hit two on a Sunday, we encourage you to come also on, on uh, Sunday evenings at 5. And you'll see all of our other ministries will also resume. There's some more announcements about that. You'll see emails coming out about that if you're involved in any of those ministries. The youth group email came out this week. So we got the download from Micah, what's coming up. Uh, but all those things kind of restart up as we get ready to go back into the full school year swing of all our ministries here at Fardale. That includes folds. So folds, like origami no not folds like origami like small group bible study so we have small group bible study they meet throughout the school year some of them meet weekly some of them uh, monthly some every third saturday right so there's a cadence throughout the the school year uh, that that we meet there are ones specifically for women specifically for men uh, we have mixed adults we have couples we have teenage ones uh, that meet right around youth group time uh, so we have them for everybody so if you want to plug into a fold, it's a great opportunity to get deeper into the word, grow spiritually, have some fellowship time uh, with like-minded folks here from the church, uh, and you want some encouragement, you, these folds end up being really close-knit circles of friends and, 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 uh, and family uh, following Christ. So we do that. So there's a foyer. Out in the foyer, there's a flyer. Uh, you can see who the contact leader is there. You can contact them. Uh, and get, get sign up for the fold of your church. If you have any questions, feel free to give the church office a call. But all the details are in the foyer. And they start up in about uh, three weeks. 
So they're usually about the third week of September, give or take, they start up. So you have a week or two to gather the information, reach out to the fold leader, figure out when you want to go, what, what, where you want to plug in. Some of them meet here at the church, some of them meet at homes uh, in the area, uh, but they're all throughout the year. So we encourage you to plug into those as well. It's a great extension of our Sunday morning worship and our other ministries that we have here and helps really build a great sense of community and fellowship here at Fardell. Also for the ladies, coming up in October is the ladies uh, fall conference. Now, as you come in this morning, if you came in, you'll see that the table closest to the stairs, the small circular table, has a sign-up sheet and more information about this. It's uh, Saturday, October 7th, uh, up in Rhinebeck, not too far away. It's a $60 fee uh, to cover the sessions, the workshops, of course, snacks and lunch, because you can't go all day without eating. That's just impossible, right? Uh, there's a, you get a voucher for a book uh, you could spend at, at the store there, but you need to register uh, by February, uh, by se February, yeah, by September. So I see I'm already in the school year. Christmas is over. I'm ready to go. It's almost tax season, right? September 17th. So you have about three weeks to do that. So the sign-up sheet's in the foyer. You can see, you can sign up in, in there. If you have any questions, Pastor Lee or Colleen are your contacts for that. So give them a, give them a ring, stop them after church this morning, ask them uh, any questions you might have. But be prepared, ladies, uh, for Saturday, October 7th, with a sign-up uh, by September 17th. So we encourage the ladies uh, to attend this, and we'll be praying for you as you head up to Rhinebeck in early October. At this time, I'm going to have Pastor Mike come up. He's going to read this morning's scripture and pray with us. Thank you, Brian. The passage of scripture this morning is 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. And it says, this is a message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. Let's pray. Lord, thank you again for the joy, the privilege, and the great opportunity we have as your people to gather this Sunday morning to set our attention on you. We thank you that we could do that through song, that we could do that through scripture reading. We could do that through hearing your word. We could do it through giving, and we do that through serving. We thank you for these opportunities that you've blessed us with. Father, in relation to this passage, we thank you that you have provided a way for us through the sacrifice of your son, Jesus, to be forgiven, redeemed, and restored. And Jesus is the only way. We know and we confess, Lord, that we are sinners who constantly mess up. We fall short of your glory. And Lord, in these moments where we do fall away, where we do sin, we, um, we pray that we would respond appropriately to our sin. That we would never become complacent in our sin. That we would never become used to it. And that we would never justify it as your people instead, Father, that we would be quick to confess and acknowledge and seek your forgiveness. And the promise here in your word is that when we do confess our sin, you are faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In relation to this sermon series on mentorship, we as your people might have opportunity to walk us walk alongside another Christian to hold them up to encourage them to keep them accountable and Lord we might have opportunity to call sin what it is in our brothers and sisters in Christ and when you open the door and provide the opportunity for that to take place I pray that we would do that lovingly graciously but truthfully in love we need you for this, Lord. In many ways, we struggle, so we just commit ourselves completely to you. 
Lord, we know that this time of year brings about a lot of excitement. This time of year also brings about, for some people, nerves. We know that there are some in our congregation who are starting new jobs. We know that there are many college students who are beginning this week or have already begun, and we want to lift them up to you. Many of our other students begin either this week or next week, and we just pray for your hand upon each one as they begin this school year. Pray for your hand of protection upon your people. Lord, we have many opportunities here, as Brian discussed, to get involved and to serve here in this place, to grow spiritually. And instead of the tendency to, to disconnect and to become so busy and weighed down with the things of this world, I pray that we would be committed to spiritual disciplines, to serve, to grow, to lean on one another, to get in your word and get in prayer, that we would be focused and committed to the things that matter for eternity. We need you. Thank you for this opportunity to hear from your word. As we do, we pray that you would open each heart and mind to hear and apply. We love you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Mike, and thank you, Brian, for our announcements. It's good to see you this morning, Fardell family, and uh, a beautiful Sunday. I can't believe it's the last Sunday in August, and here we go right into the fall. But it's been a good summer. Uh, the Lord's been good. Uh, we've seen a lot of good things happening in our ministries over the summer, and we praise Him for that. And as both Pastor Mike prayed and as Brian highlighted in their announcements, um, there's some good opportunities for this fall. would really encourage you to get involved in a fold. A fold is a place where you can grow and have fellowship, study the Word together. There's about eight different options on that flyer out there. Pick one up, contact the leader. Get started on it. You won't be sorry. It's a great opportunity to grow together and uh, encourage each other in our walk with Christ. And then, uh, ladies, that uh, uh, <clears throat> ladies' conference is really good. I encourage you to think about that. Men, you'll be hearing about a possibility of a men's retreat that we're going to be looking at in October as well. Uh, teens, bonfire coming up, kids, kids' night. Man, all sorts of good things happening. So uh, here we go. Roll up the sleeves. Uh, somebody posted on Facebook that we're about ready to enter the Burr months, you know, September, October, November, December. The first one isn't so bad, but uh, it's a good time, good time of year to just kind of rethink about what God is doing in our lives and get involved in serving Him. Okay, <clears throat> join me this morning in Exodus chapter 32. Uh, if you have your Bibles, uh, that's the passage we'll be in, and... Uh, <clears throat> A lot of the verses will be up on the screen as well, or if you don't have a copy of the Bible and you'd like one, there's one in the pew rack. So we've been working through this series, kind of hopscotching, because last week we had Ken McGilvery here, and um, uh, <clears throat> so we've been kind of like uh, hitting and missing for the first three weeks, but now we'll uh, steadily uh, finish this series on mentoring. And... Um, what do we mean when we talk about mentoring the next generation? Well, here's a couple of concepts as we review just to uh, rethink or, or get us uh, back into this process that we're talking about. Remember, the word mentor means a, a wise advisor, a teacher, or a coach, someone who is really willing to invest in someone else. Is that you? Have you chosen someone, even in your immediate family, or maybe another brother or sister here that, that maybe needs to, to grow to the next level in their Christian life. And the, the word is actually taken from Homer's Odyssey. Mentor was actually a steward in the king's home where uh, he was going off to war. His teenage son, uh, he would be missing him for the next five to ten years. By the time he came back, he would be a young man. And he asked Mentor to take his son and prepare him to be the next king. And that's important as we look at this third point. Mentoring is specific in training a mentee for a specific role of leadership. In other words, when we think of mentoring, there is an end goal in sight. It's to prepare someone to step to the plate 
and accept their God-given spiritual gifts and abilities to grow and become a leader. Life and leadership transference is really the goal. Now, we've talked about five steps in mentoring, and the reason I point this out is because in mentoring, it's important to identify which step you are working on with the mentee. It starts with salvation. Maybe they need to just come to know the Lord, make sure of their salvation. After that, the beginning of growth, which then builds into a life of service and a life of sacrifice, and then eventually a life of leadership, saying, I will become the servant leader that God wants me to be. So if you are working with someone and you're asking God to help you to be that wise counselor or coach or encourager, help that person by identifying what step they're at in their spiritual growth so that you can get them to the next level. And in this series, we've been talking about the specific example of mentoring that we're looking at is uh, Moses mentoring Joshua. Because as you remember, at the end of Deuteronomy and then heading into the book of Joshua, it was all about, during those 40 years of wilderness wanderings, that Moses would step down as the leader. God would remove him from his position of leadership. Who would be ready to take charge? Well, it was this young man, Joshua. And the six lessons we're looking at are specific to see Joshua learning an important thing about becoming a servant leader for the people, okay? Very important that we see that. Moses was intentional in passing the torch, passing the baton, if you will, to develop a leader. Is that important for us? Absolutely. In your home, you need to be mentoring your own children. But in our church, we are at a point where we need to seriously consider who will be the next generation leaders for Fardale Trinity Church. Um, some of us aren't getting any younger, are we? And so when we know that, we ought to say, all right, what can I do to help prepare the next generation so that this church will not only survive, but will thrive in the days ahead until Jesus comes. I don't ever want, and I, you, you don't ever want, to see Fardale set on the shelf and no longer being effective in the gospel ministry or making an impact for Christ here in Bergen County. But that's going to take identification and um, intentional training or mentoring of others to step to the plate in those leadership roles. And as we stated, the playing field is our own homes and our own church so that we can apply these uh, six life lessons that we're looking at of Moses saying to Joshua, you need to remember this. You need to hold on to this. This is something important if you're going to have an impact in leading God's people. The same is true for us. So, here's where we've been so far. We talked about the power of prayer at uh, Rephidim, where Moses held up his hands and Joshua saw that God gave the victory through the power of prayer, prayer calling on prayer. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we talked about how to really know God. And Moses was up on the mountain and he was talking face to face with God and he took some of his leaders with him halfway up the mountain. That's where we left off. In fact, that is the context or the pretext to what we're going to be looking at today. The passage we're going to be looking at today begs us to ask that question, what essentially must we teach and mentor to pass on to the next generation? In other words, what is it that we want the next generation to know, to hold on to? And today's lesson is a difficult one. I'll tell you what, it's a hard one to preach. It was a hard one for me to study because it deals with a horrible situation that happened in Israel. Right after the context of Moses receiving the law on the mountain then and coming down, and we'll see today what he found, and it was not a good situation the awfulness of sin. Now, before I read this passage, 
I want to ask you a question. If your son or daughter was about to commit a horrible mistake, uh, you knew it, and you knew that what they were about to do would mark them for the rest of their life. Maybe it would be trying a little bit of entertaining drug life or involving an immoral or sexual pr uh, promiscuity or, or even a, a choice of friends that you said, you know what, I think they would probably be in trouble for you. Would you as a parent warn them? Would you talk to them? Would you in love say, hey, you know, listen, I, I got to warn you, what, what I see is not good, and I think it's going to have a negative impact in your life. You see, this lesson we're about to look at today shows us that part of mentoring is giving warnings. Uh, the book of Proverbs is really a mentoring book in a lot of information about a, a king or, or someone else who is giving out warnings to those who will listen so that they don't waste their life, so they don't mess up. The passage we're going to look at today is a stern warning that we must pass on to the next generation that there are consequences for sin. The awfulness of sin can wreck lives, can really damage families and nations and churches. And Joshua needed to learn as a leader, don't let sin continue in the camp. Warn, mark it, and repent from it. Now, I don't often do this, but I think it's important to see the whole story. So I'm going to take a few minutes to read together with you all of Exodus chapter 32. You can follow along on the screen or in your scriptures. Here's what the story says. Now, I want to highlight one verse before we get into Exodus 32, and it's the last verse of 31 Verse 18, Moses was up on the mountain, and God gave to Moses, when he had finished speaking with him on Mount Sinai, the two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. That's where we were two weeks ago, God giving the Ten Commandments, the law, to Moses on top of the mountain, and now Moses is coming down the mountain. What did he see? Follow along as we read. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from that mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron, Moses' brother, and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we have no idea what has become of him. Remember how long was Moses up on top of the mountain meeting with God? Forty days and forty nights. It took less than two months for the people to turn coat on God. And here they were saying, well, we don't know what happened to this Moses. So Aaron said to them, okay, okay, you win. Take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters. Bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears, brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. Have you ever asked the question, why a calf, Aaron? Why on earth did you decide to give Israel a new God in the shape of a calf? I mean, why not a ram? Why not an eagle? Why not a giant? You know, a, a, a calf. Well, he probably learned that from observing some of the gods that the Egyptians worshipped, right? And so he said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Unbelievable that he could fashion a golden idol in the form of a calf and said, Here's your new God. And by the way, this is the God that brought you out of Egypt. Not so. It was Yahweh. It was Jehovah God. How soon they forgot. 
Verse 5, when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And he made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow there will be a feast to the Lord, to this new Lord, the calf. And they rose up early the next day. They offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. There's a new God in Israel, the calf God. And the Lord said to Moses, up on the mountain, Go down, for your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and are now worshiping it and sacrificing to it. And they have said to this golden calf, here are the gods, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Can you imagine what Jehovah God was feeling at that point? because of the total rejection of his chosen people. Verse 9, And the Lord said to Moses, I've seen this people. Behold, they are a stiff-necked, that means a stubborn people. Now therefore let me alone, so that my wrath can burn hot against them, and I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation from you, Moses. But Moses, the diplomat, the intercessor, implored the Lord his God and said, Oh, Lord, Why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Now Moses knew that God had every right to destroy the people, but he was trying to be an intercessor for them at this point. Verse 12, why should the Egyptians be able to say with evil intent did he bring them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? In other words, Moses was holding up God's reputation here. And he says, turn from your burning anger, O Lord, and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham and Isaac and Israel? What's Moses doing? He's going back to the covenants that God had made to his people. To whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and all this land that I have promised I will give to your offspring and they will inherit it forever. So Moses is reminding God of what's at stake here. God, your reputation, what you said you would do for your people will be gone forever if you destroy them. Verse 14, look at the change of heart from Yahweh, Jehovah God, and the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people. And Moses turned and went down from the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, tablets that were written on both sides, on the front and the back, they were written. And the tablets were the work of God. The writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. And when Joshua heard the noise, now remember Joshua was up on the mountain with Moses. They're coming down and he heard the noise of the people and they, as they shouted, Joshua said to Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp. Interesting how their worship of that golden calf sounded like war to Joshua. But Moses said, verse 18, it's not the sound of shouting for victory or the sound of the cry of defeat, but the sound of singing that we're hearing. And as soon as he came near the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, then Moses' anger burned hot. And he threw the tablets, the tablets that God had written in stone, he threw the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. And he took that calf that they had made and he burned it with fire and he ground the powder of the calf and scattered it on the water supply and he made the people to drink of it. And Moses said to Aaron, What did this people do to you? Now remember who Aaron was, his brother, the high priest? What have they done to you, Aaron, that you brought such a great sin upon them? Verse 22, and Aaron said, and by the way, you're looking at one of the biggest wimps in the history of God's recorded revelation right here. Oh, Moses, let not the anger of my Lord burn hot. You know the people, they're always set on evil. 
For they said to me, make us some gods who will go before us because we don't know where Moses is. This Moses, who man, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what's become of him. <laughs> and so I said to them, well, you have gold? Give it to me. And I threw it into the fire and poof, out came this calf. Ooh, Aaron was a magician. We'll come back to that one. And when Moses saw that the people had broken loose, for Aaron had let them break loose uh, to the derision of their enemies, Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? You come to me right now. And all of the sons of Levi gathered around him, and he said to them, This is what God says. Put your sword on your side, each of you, and go to and fro from gate to gate throughout the camp, and each of you kill his brother and his companion and his neighbor. Why? They had an opportunity to respond to Moses' command, who is on the Lord's side, and they rejected that opportunity. And so Moses said, I will, on behalf of God, execute justice. And the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses. And that day, about 3,000 men of the people fell probably more, with women and children. And Moses said, Today you have been ordained for the service of the Lord. He's saying this to the Levites. Each one of you at the cost of his son and his brother so that he might bestow a blessing on you this day. And the next day Moses said to the people, You have sinned a great sin. And now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for you for your sin so Moses returned to the Lord and said, Alas, this people has sinned a great sin. They have made for themselves gods of gold. He's retelling God what God already knew had happened. But now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, please blot me out of your book that you have written. Wow, Moses is putting his own life on the line here. And the Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. Justice was served that day. But now, you go and lead the people to the place about which I have spoken to you. Behold, my angels shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. And then the Lord sent a plague on the people because they made the calf, the one that Aaron made. A very sad story a story of disobedience and rebellion, a story where the people in a very short time forgot how to trust God, forgot who God was, forgot that he was Yahweh, Jehovah, I am that I am, the one who uh, used Moses to demonstrate the power of God through the ten plagues on Egypt, the one who led them out of slavery and into the wilderness, the one who was taking them to the promised land. And in one instance, where God chose to bring Moses, their leader, up on the mountain to commune with him and give him the law, Israel could not hold on to faithful living and turn to disobedience. So through this story, and the good and the bad mentors us, teaches us life lessons that we must hear and we must respond to. So what can we observe from this passage that we can pass on to the next generation? Four devastating results of sin that should motivate us to mentor and warn others of our generation. Don't become like disobedient Israel in the wilderness. I just want to give you four principles that will help us to understand how awful sin really is. The first one is this. Simply stated, sin breaks God's law. Sin breaks God's law. You remember what the passage said? Here's God telling Moses, here's what you're going to see when you get to the bottom of the mountain. Uh, your people, my people, have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, 
who brought you out of the Lord, out of the land of Egypt. Now, remember with me here for a second. God's, or, uh, Moses is receiving the law from God, the Ten Commandments. All right, a little quiz time here. How many of the Ten Commandments do you remember? Shout them out. What do you remember of the Ten Commandments? Hmm? What? No other gods before me. You get an A plus, Alice. That, that's, we're going to come back to that one. But what are some of the other commandments? Come on. What? No idols. Okay, obey your father and mother. I like that one. What else? Hmm? Thou shalt not kill. Oh, steal? Steal or kill. I guess either one of them is pretty bad. Any others that you remember? What? Don't covet. Anything else? Do not commit adultery. Where was the other one? Remember the Sabbath. So here are ten specific instructions. Do, do you think, now I, I, I'm going to give Israel the benefit of the doubt because they had not yet read those tablets of stone. Do you think that God was giving them anything new? Or did they already know? And, and basically the law codified what, was, what God was saying was for their own protection. I'm giving you these laws to warn you and protect you from falling into sin. Don't murder. Why? <laughs> because you're killing someone else that's made the image of God. Don't covet. You don't desire something that belongs to you. Honor your father and mother. Listen to them. Worship on the Sabbath. All of these things are for our protection. Whereas the law could never save anyone. It can't. You can't get to heaven by obeying the law. But the purpose of the law was to be a schoolmaster, to teach us how to order our lives and warn us so that we not get ourselves in trouble. And interesting, now I'm going to go back here. What do you think was the major law that they broke when they built the calf? What was it? Yeah. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. You shall not build any graven image. And here, in 40 days, they'd forgotten the wonder of who God was and tried to form God as a golden calf. So they broke that commandment. And Moses' response, you see... There was both a literal breaking of the law. He threw down the tablets of stone, broke the law, but then figuratively, I don't know what's going on here. Figuratively, they broke the law as well. Uh, he broke the, the tablets of stone. They broke the law by their disobedience. And God was ready to destroy the people for their sin. He said, they're stiff-necked. They, they can't even stay loyal to me for six weeks while you're gone, the people broke God's law. Moses symbolizes the breaking of the law, and he says, that's exactly what you've done. You have ignored God, and you are entered into a period of disobedience in your life. Now, as we go through this passage, I want to highlight these four principles, but I also want to give you a New Testament corollary for each of them. Here's the New Testament corollary for this. A similar New Testament principle from 1 John 3, 4 says this, everyone who makes a practice of sinning, now notice that, makes a practice of sinning. Uh, Pastor Mike prayed in his prayer this morning something similar. Lord, don't let us get comfortable in our sin. Don't let us stay there. Israel was willing to stay there. Israel was willing to say, look, I don't want Jehovah God anymore. I really like this golden calf. In fact, let's make some football helmets and put the golden calf on the side of the football helmet. It's that important to us. And there they were, staying there. John says, everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. And here's the statement, sin is lawlessness. 
Sin is breaking God's law. So when we choose to disobey the warnings that God gives us, even John is saying, you've basically thrown your lives into a dangerous situation. Sin breaks God's law. I read this story how sometimes you can't repair what's been done. A a child asked a man to pick a flower for her. Well, that was a simple enough task. He did it and gave her the flower. But then she said, now, can you put it back? The man experienced a baffling helplessness he never knew before. How can you explain to a child that that cannot be done? How can one make clear to young people that there are some things which once broken, once mutilated, can never be replaced or mended? Israel suffered greatly because of their sin that day. Was sin forgiven? Yes, we'll get to the end of the story, but don't miss the beginning of the story. There were great, devastating results because sin breaks God's law. Secondly, Sin produces bitterness. Do not let the evil one deceive you into thinking that the choices we make that are apart from God's law will somehow satisfy us in the long term. They will not. They will bring satisfaction in the short term. There is pleasure in sin for a season, for a short time. But in the long term, sin manifests itself for what it is, and it creates a bitterness, a brokenness in the individual who stays there and won't repent of it. Now look at the the very uh, graphic picture of the bitterness of sin. Uh, Here's what um, happened. Um, He took the calf that they had made, and he burned the calf with fire, Moses did, and he ground it into a powder and scattered it on the water and made the people of Israel drink it. Now, I I tried to relate to what's happening here. I, I don't think I've ever had to drink water that was tainted by, I mean, gold dust? Some of you may have tasted water that has kind of a metallic type of taste to it. Um, I don't know, maybe maybe the Mawa water has some gold dust in it. I don't know. But, but certainly we can understand that when, when we're drinking water that is less than pure, it does not satisfy. There's a, there's a bitter aftertaste, and we're even thinking, what did I just drink? Oh, no, it, it, you know. Is, is there poison in there? Is there bacteria in there? Is there something that's going to be bad for my system? And so he took that golden calf. Now remember, all of the gold that they had brought in from their earrings, their necklaces, their bracelets, to form this calf, and I'm sure it was not a small thing. If all of Israel was gathered around this calf, I can imagine that the, that golden calf would be probably as big as our stage. Now there's an idea for VBS, Pastor Mike. Build that golden calf up here. And um, help kids see, here's the God that Israel chose to worship, and Moses ground that puppy down to nothing and spread the gold dust on the water and said, Israel, you will now drink of the God that you have chosen to serve. And I'm sure at that point, and pardon my graphic depiction, but it was probably pretty much of a vomit fest at that point. They couldn't stand the bitterness of the water. Here's the lesson, obviously, and and here's the New Testament corollary. Hebrews 12, 15 is an application of Moses' action here. As to the bitter taste of sin, The author of Hebrews says, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. Israel that day had failed to obtain the grace of God because of their choice in disobeying, which led to bitterness. 
And even the author of Hebrews says that when you fail to obtain the grace of God, that a root of bitterness can spring up in you and causes trouble, and by it, many will be defiled. Here's the issue. The bitter effects of sin not only was there for individuals to experience, but for the entire nation to be affected And the lesson of burning and grinding the golden calf, then pouring it in the water supply to make the people drink it, is a reminder to all of us that there is a bitter, lasting taste for sin. Here's the warning to the next generation, friends. Shout it. Get in their face lovingly. Tell them. Explain to them you are not going to like the taste of your life if you go this direction. There's going to be ruination. There's going to be problems. There's going to be a bitterness in your soul that you will not be able to escape if you willingly choose to disobey God, defy Him, walk another way, and stay in that pathway. You can almost, not almost, you will experience a bitter life if you camp out in your own sin. Third principle, sin weakens our character. Sin weakens our character. There was a lot of people that when they chose to follow the golden calf, their personal character was destroyed. Here's what we read. Now, you'll you'll get the point as to who is being used as the... uh, the, the example of weakened character. And Moses said to Aaron, Aaron, what did this people do to you? <laughs> that you've brought such a great sin upon them. You can almost see where Moses is going. Well, did they torture you? Did they threaten you? Did they say they were going to throw you out of the camp? What did they do to you that made you as the high priest who should have known better, who should have led the people in truth, who should have comforted them, who should have told them, look, God is God. He will return Moses to us when he's ready to return. You could have been the example instead. What did you do? And Aaron goes into this litany of excuses. Oh, Moses, don't be, don't, don't be hot. Don't be mad at me. You you know it's the people's fault because they're set on evil. And you know that they they told me to make us gods, and so I said to them, you know, give me gold. So so here's the here's the guy that's uh, got a weakened character. Aaron the priest. He he caved that day, no doubt about it. He caved. And victims of specific sin are caught in the five steps of the sin cycle. We'll look at that in a second. But, but did you notice the last verse? Uh, th- this really goes in line with what we're about to study. Verse 24, I said to them, let any of them have gold, take it off. So they gave it to me, and I threw it in the fire, and pff, out came this calf. I'll tell you, that is the most laughable verse in the Old Testament. That he, he got all the gold, he... He he burned it, and and he put it in the fire, and out came this calf. It's a miracle. Wow. Uh, You know, a calf just came out of the fire. It's like Aaron's version of the Big Bang Theory. You know, boom, out pops this calf. By itself, it just formed itself. I I have nothing to do with it, Moses. I mean, I washed my hands of this. A calf came out of the fire. Well, that, that leads us to seeing in Aaron's life how he totally rejected God's remedy for dealing with sin that weakens our character. You see, you get involved in this sin cycle, and here's part of the warning. You begin to make excuses. You say, well, God's not fair. He's expecting too much. Or really, it was somebody else. The, the devil made me do it. Other people made me do it. My friends made me do it. Well, how are, are they more powerful than you? And then we blame shift. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not my fault. It's their fault. And then we rationalize. It, it's really not so bad. I mean, come on, Moses. It, it is a God. And after all, God made 
calves, did he not? So it, it's part of God's creation. So it's, it's a legitimate God. And then denial. Well, I, I really, you know, I, it really wasn't my fault that I got involved in the sin. And then deception, that it's okay to replace God with your own gods. No, it's not. I read this article recently about the nine personality traits of addicts, people who have given themselves to sin to the point where their character is completely changed, completely weakened. The author says this, that whether it is alcohol or drugs or sexual addiction, compulsive gambling, whatever the addict has, essentially the same traits are innate in them. And it's a man by the name of Alan Lang in his Substance Abuse and Habitual Behavior Report. He identifies nine such characteristics that go along with this five-step sin cycle. He talks about impulsive behavior. They can't control themselves. They just do it because now they're sold in sin. Difficulty in delaying gratification. I got to have it now. You see, we think we're just playing around with sin, and then all of a sudden it grabs us, and we want more of it. Thirdly, sensation-seeking. It's not good enough. I need a high. Four, antisocial personality. Five, a nonconformist value system. Six, a sense of alienation from others because the sin habit does that to you. Seven, defiant behavior. No, I'm not going to change. Eight, heightened feelings of stress. Nine, little regard for goals generally valued by the rest of society or by a moral code that would keep you from going down that path of destruction. Out came the calf is not the answer. Aaron caved, his character was weakened because he would not stand up to sin, and then he led the people in national sin to defy God. The last principle is the end of the story, and that is that sin always results in death. Look at what happened at the end of the story. Moses said to them, the sons of evil, so, excuse me, the sons of Levi, <laughs> almost evil, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, put your sword on the side of each of you and go to and fro from gate to gate throughout the camp. Kill his brother and companion and his neighbor. And the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses and 3,000 men of the people fell that day. Here's a quick review of this principle. A biblical review of the sin equals death principle. What, is, what happened in Adam's life, remember? If you eat, you will die. And he experienced that. He experienced death, separation from God, because he chose to disobey. Ezekiel, the prophet, says the soul that sins, that continues to sin, it will die. Sin brings about death. The Apostle Paul said it this way, the wages, the earnings, what you get as a reward for sin is death. So here's the mentoring principle that's tucked away in this passage in verse 17. On that day, Joshua, the one that Moses was mentoring, saw all of this devastation. When they came down the mountain, he heard the noise of the people as they shouted and to him, it sounded like there was a noise of war in the camp. There was a noise of defiance. There was a noise of sin leading to death. So I want to close today by just giving you four brief New Testament life applications to this story. Number one, here's the good news. God has provided one way and one way only to overcome the awfulness of sin, and it's called confession. And we read it from 1 John chapter 1 this morning. This verse, you probably know it. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But even when confronted with their sin, Moses asked the people, what have you done? Who is on the Lord's side? Oh, no, not us. I I'm going to deny 
I'm going to shift blame. It's Aaron's fault. They had a chance to confess and repent, and they didn't. Now, look at what this verse says. It says, if we confess our sins, it does not say, if we tell God, I'm sorry. God, I'm sorry. Could I encourage you with something? When sin invades your life, don't go to God initially and say, God, I'm sorry. Uh, confession is not just simply telling God you're sorry and asking him to forgive you. By the way, he already has. Based on what Jesus did on the cross, he's already paid for your sins. It's already forgiven. Past, present, and future sins. All taken care of. So what this verse is asking us to do is not just to tell God that we're sorry and ask him to forgive us. Oh, that, that's part of it. But what confession really means is calling the sin what God calls it and repenting from it. Israel refused to do that that day. They said, we, we haven't done anything wrong. And so much of the time when sin invades our lives secretly or, or we're, we're trying to resist it, but... but and we're trying to apply this principle. All we're doing is saying, God, I'm sorry. But what we really need to do is name the sin, call it what God calls it, and then repent from it. When and why have we stopped calling sin what it is? Why is alcoholism or sexual addiction, why is that just a behavioral problem? instead of sin. Name it for what God names it to be. Secondly, in this life we will always have a struggle with the awfulness of sin, but it can be overcome. Remember what Paul said concerning the sin that we battle against in our own lives? What shall we say? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. Notice, don't keep sinning so that you can experience more of God's grace. That's not why Christ gave his life for you. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Christ came to redeem us and deliver us from the effects of our sin. He goes on to say, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who would have brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. Isn't that an amazing statement? We're not under the law. The law has warned us, but we are now under grace, the grace that has been taken care of forever by the once-for-all sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So don't just excuse sin by saying, well, I, I can't deal with it. I can't overcome it. Yes, you can. Because Jesus Christ has already provided the way. Oh, that Israel would have done that that day and said, Lord, we don't want to continue in our sin. We made a mistake. That golden calf is gone. We're going to now wholeheartedly follow you. Friends, we need to make that same kind of choice. Thirdly, what sins do you struggle with the most? We all have them, don't we? And you know what? For some of us, it might be different than the others. What you struggle with as far as temptation or a sin that overcomes you. But remember that it is Jesus who is the founder and perfecter of your faith, and he wants you to overcome that sin and live above it. Hebrews 12, we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. So, Lay aside every way, and look at this, the sin which clings so closely to you. Keep running with endurance the race that is set before you, and look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of your faith. Identify the sin you struggle with the most, and say to the one who provided for your salvation, by your power, by your grace, I will overcome that sin. It's you, God, working in me that will give me the strength, the power to overcome that sin. And then the last application. God's ultimate plan for you is to help you and keep you from falling into sin so that your holiness is completely restored. I love this verse. It's kind of a benediction verse from Jude 24. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling 
and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. That's God's purpose. So that you don't have to experience the death of sin, the bitterness of sin, the excuses of sin. And we can help the next generation see how awful sin is and turn away from its devastating effects. Because God's plan is our holiness. And his plan is to present us blameless before the Heavenly Father. Here's the question. Will you help and mentor others to apply these principles we've learned in fighting the battle of the awfulness of sin? So a final thought on this story. Sin kills. Sin is our enemy. At Mount Sinai that day, 3,000 people died as a result of disobeying God and the awfulness of their sin. That's a lot of lost lives. It's a tragedy. Like I say, a very sad story. But the contrast for us as believers is this. Jesus is life. Right? 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 Yeah. He is the one that can help us overcome even the practice of sin. Hey, do you remember another mountain where disobedience and sin was more overwhelming than Sinai? It was a place called Calvary. All of the sins of the world for generations, for thousands of years, poured upon the sinless Lamb of God. And as a result, people could escape their sin and be made alive. We used to sing an old song, Look and live, my brother, look and live. Look to Jesus now and live. Here's an interesting thing about the 3,000 people thing. 3,000 people died because they wouldn't repent of their sin at Mount Sinai. If you read Acts chapter 2, in Penico, the day of Pentecost, as a result of the sin paid for at Mount Calvary, 3,000 people were made alive that day. And so the choice really is a, a graphic one. We can either continue in sin, or we can take the grace that God gives us to overcome it and be made alive. Friends, I share this passage, this story with you, as much for my own edification as I do for yours. We see all around us the devastating effects of how sin destroys lives, do we not? Sometimes it's outside of the church, but sometimes it creeps into the church too. So let's think about this story of Moses mentoring Joshua and say, Joshua, never forget what happened at Mount Sinai. Our calling is to teach the next generation how awful sin is so that it doesn't ruin their lives. Turn to Christ. Look and live. Because life is better than death. And that's a life lesson that those that we're mentoring must understand. There will be choices to either follow a life of sin or to follow God. Follow Jesus Christ experience his forgiveness, his grace. Father, help us to apply these truths. Help us to be warned of how awful sin is, how it really can destroy people's lives. And as we warn others, help us, Lord, to warn ourselves. None of us are immune to temptation or falling prey to Satan's devices. So keep us strong, keep us focused, focused on the author and finisher of our faith. And help us to continue to warn the next generation, even as we warn ourselves, to walk away from sin, to repent of it, to name it what you name it, and to claim the victory that is ours through Jesus Christ our Lord. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen. Let's rise and worship the Lord with our voices again.
love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Have a blessed week, folks. Thank you.